Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. This is Darlene, Kate's podcast editor. Kate was planning to take an RV trip across the US. However, her sweet dog Gaia was injured and so Kate's travel plans were canceled. Now, Gaia is on the mend, thankfully. And so in the name of self-care, Kate is taking a break from the podcast recording this week. But don't worry, she actually has a brand new episode for you today. And on her behalf, I will be doing the introduction. In this episode, you'll hear a conversation between Kate Anthony and her guest, Chris Beck, VP of Business Development for Soberlink Healthcare. Now, if you've been listening to Kate's show for a while, you may have heard her speak about Soberlink before. It's a remote alcohol monitoring device which can be used as a tool for a co-parenting relationship in which alcohol abuse may be a concern. They take a deep dive into Soberlink and explain how it can be used as an empowering tool after divorce. Let me tell you a little bit about Chris Beck. As I mentioned, he is the VP of Business Development for Soberlink Healthcare. Chris's primary responsibilities include working with family law judges, attorneys, and healthcare professionals across the U.S. to educate them on Soberlink's modern approach to alcohol monitoring for child custody cases. He has led over 25 one-hour educational presentations and continues to find new opportunities to raise awareness around alcohol monitoring and child safety. I would like to thank you for bearing with me as I take on the role of podcast episode introduction assistant while Kate is away, and she'll be back in the podcast episodes very soon. And so without further ado, here is the conversation between Kate Anthony and Chris Beck. Enjoy. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us on the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. So um, I'm a huge fan of Soberlink, and uh, you are the VP of Business Development for Soberlink. <laughs> that is right. Yeah. So everything family law, that's where I come into play. Yes. Yeah. So tell us, tell, tell everyone what, I mean, I've talked about Soberlink a number of times on the podcast, but so this is sort of a deep dive into something that I've, that I've mentioned uh, time and again. So tell us exactly what Soberlink is and what it does. So really Soberlink is a tool to remotely measure alcohol in an individual that might not be close to you. That is somewhere else. So our technology is a professional breathalyzer. We combine it with a camera and it has a wireless way of communicating the BAC and the identity confirmation to anyone that's on the monitoring agreement. So what happens is the monitor client would blow into the device. It takes a photo of them, uses facial recognition software during that test to confirm the identity, make sure it's not a sober buddy. And then those results are sent to usually the X most typically. But anyone that's on the monitoring agreement could be a mental health professional, it could be a sober coach, it could be the attorneys that are involved in the case. So numerous people that could actually get these results, but they're usually sent in about 60 seconds after the test is taken. So you know in real time that, well, what is happening with that particular individual. Okay. So so just to sort of break it down, right, let's say my ex has a problem with alcohol, has a history of alcohol um, abuse. And I, in our custody agreement, I'm concerned that he may be using or dr- drinking during during his custody time. So we set this up 
so that it's basically proof, right? It's basically him proving to me that he's sober during parenting time. Exactly. And what I always like to say is that it's an empowerment tool for him yeah. to then say, hey, this is not an issue. Um, I'm documenting my sobriety to you so that you can earn some trust back. Right. I know that maybe when we were together, you were the one that policed me while I was maybe having too many drinks. And now that we're apart, you're afraid that there's no one to police me. But what's happening is now with a technology like Soberlink, we're able to get those real time results and you're able to look at them and say, hey, I have peace of mind that my kiddos are safe while with my ex. Mm -hmm. I love it. And what I love, I love that the facial recognition piece, having been in a situation with my family, with someone who was definitely gaming the system <laughs> with some tests like urine tests that you can easily have somebody else do for you or, or not easily, but if you're, if you're, I mean, there's always a way, right? There's like a, you there's go on the internet and it's like 10 Google searches deep, right? Of yeah. how to beat that test. So of how know. to do it. Exactly. Exactly. And so the fact that there's this facial recognition component, I am all about, and there's also timing agreements, right? So you can set it up so that there, so that there's like a timing agreement, right? Like that's absolutely right. So we have two different programs. We have a level one and a level two. Our level one is more about testing around parenting time periods. So let's say there's an accusa accusation about uh, alcohol use during parenting time, but you just don't have the proof to back it up to test seven days a week. Right. Parenting time only might be the right choice for for this situation. So right. what would happen is that person would test one hour prior to the parenting time period to say, okay, we're ready for the exchange of the kids. I would test maybe every three to four hours during the parenting time and then after drop-off. So you have documented sobriety of during that parenting time period. Of the, so the entire right. parenting time period is, is now seen as I was sober during that time. Our level two programs, more of testing three to four times seven days a week. Now, this is maybe somebody that's coming out of treatment. It's more of our treatment model. So what we're looking for here is to change behavior. So we're doing scheduled tests. And usually that test is right when you wake up, maybe midday, maybe around four o'clock in the afternoon, and then right before you go to bed. So it's spaced out evenly through the day, but you're testing on a schedule. And that's really important because, you know, it, People always thought of alcohol testing as we should do it random because we want to catch that person. But that's not really what we're after. You know, we want to make sure we keep the best interests of the child in mind. And we don't want that parent to have so much anxiety that it then leads to even more drinking, it, you know, right. or it could yes. trigger something there. That's not what we want. We want to make sure that we're bringing the family unit back together. And we're earning trust back by empowering that individual to take those tests. And then the other party gets a little peace of mind that, yeah, you know, this is working. And I'm seeing my ex be parenting my child while they are sober. So that's really important. What happens if there is a positive test during parenting time? Sure. So each case is a little bit different and it really speaks to some of the things that maybe have happened in the past. So every case is going to be different, but most typically what happens is that that parenting time is suspended when you get that positive test. So then there's some type of protocol for a pickup of that child, whether it be primary parent, or maybe there's a grandparent that's also on the list to pick up if that makes sense. Which might be and less then, sort of combative. It's just sort of combative, sure. protocol. This is the deal. Yeah. It's not like this a parent is, coming to the door being angry or. And the last thing we want you to do is have to go back to court because there was a positive test. So we always recommend that all the attorneys write into the parenting plan. What happens if there's a positive? Because remember, if there truly is a issue with alcohol abuse and AUD, part of recovery is relapse. So you're going to have some of those. It's, mm. it's inevitable. We have about 80% of those that are on our program. We do see positive tests. So we know it's part of it, right. but that's the idea. You have to understand it is a disease. It's going to come back, but let's have some consequences in place and protocols in place 
so that they, we can keep those kids safe. And so usually, most typically, it's a in the parenting time period, then you have to establish sobriety maybe for a week or so to make sure that you're back on track with the program and then parenting time is being stated. I really like that as a sober person myself, I really like that this is not punitive. It's not right. meant to, cat, like you said, it's not meant to catch them. It's not meant to, yes. it's not an oppressive tool. It's a unifying tool. It's a, and, a, and an empowering tool as opposed to like, oh, gotcha. So you're screwed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Divorce is contentious enough. The last right. thing we need to do is, is add another layer of that. Yeah, right. we're, we're trying to keep people together, family unit together as closely as possible as what, how it looked before this unfortunate divorce happened. And we understand that alcohol use can be brought up in many of the cases. It's a big issue and we want to have a tool that can help. Yeah. I love that. I love that about, about this. I always, you know, I have clients or friends who have, you know, a history of alcohol use, right? And I always recommend using Soberlink as a, like as a peace offering, right? It's a, it's an olive branch. It's to say, so it's not, it can't, it's not, doesn't have to just be something that is sort of levied upon you, but Mm -hmm. it can also be something that's offered, right? Like, I know that I have a history of this. Like you said, I know that in the marriage, I had a history of this. I want you to know that I'm working on it. And I want you to know that I'm taking it this seriously, that here's what I'm, here's what I'm prepared to do. And here's what I'd like to do as a sort of an offering, right? As a, as a gift to this process. No, you're absolutely right. Um, we see a little bit of that. Um, when I talk about our treatment side of our business, we're really trying to define ourselves as the continued care arm of treatment. So let's say you go into your 28-day stay and you go through the whole treatment side of things. In the past, it's kind of like a handshake at the end of that. And then you're off. You're, you're trying to get through on your own, right? And <laughs> That, that's a little bit disturbing. You're like, wow, you yeah. know, I spent 28 days and I, a lot of money and now I'm just kind of being sent off. And really what Soberlink can do is keep you communicating with those professionals that helped with the treatment and even the sober coaches that go along with it. So that long term reduces recidivism and we can say, okay, every time I take a test and I test compliant, I'm one step closer to making sure this program is sticking. Yeah. So there are, there are sober coaches that go along with Soberlink. Is that what? Not with Soberlink, but a lot of times with treatment facilities, oh, with treatment they'll facilities. have Soberlink. They'll have sober coaches that will extend out in that continued care model. Yes. Hopefully they do. I mean, at the very least, like you shouldn't go from treatment to like your own devices, right? I mean, you're on your own. At least, yeah, at least there's AA sponsorship, right. like whatever, yeah. whatever it may be. Right. And one of the things that I really appreciate sort of in this, you know, like we were just talking about is that one of your goals is reducing the stigma around alcohol use. So can you talk about that? Like how you guys, what does that mean from like an internal, external? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, really it, it comes down to education. A lot of what we do in family law market is education to attorneys and allow them to understand what the disease model really looks like. You have, I understand there's a couple of different things that happen in family law cases. It's maybe those cases where they didn't go to treatment. Maybe there's not a huge alcohol problem, but there's been some abuse. Mm -hmm. And then there's some, some cases where there's definite abuse. They've gone to treatment and they're trying to get sober. So there's two different things, two different sides there, Mm -hmm. but we're always trying to educate the disease model and what that means and making sure that as we go back in the conversation that we had, it's not a, I'm trying to catch you. Yeah. It's a, I am trying to change behavior and help you. And I want you to be a part of our child's life for the rest of your life as well. And this is only going to help because that positive reinforcement of seeing those compliant tests come in really changes behavior. We have clinical psychologists that actually say, one year of using Soberlink on schedule, you'll start to see that clinical change in behavior. And that's really the key to this. So in our best practices, we always say you should be on our system for about a year to see those clinical changes in behavior. And what are the clinical changes in behavior that you're, that you're looking at? Referring to, sure. So, you know, if you were abusive with alcohol, there was always that point in which drove you to drink 
what was that trigger, right? And so a lot of times they'll replace that trigger with a test so that instead of the two o'clock test, I used to have a trigger right before I picked my kids up to school and that was at three o'clock. So let's move that test to three o'clock. So now you get some positive reinforcement about compliant behavior instead of, oh, let me find the alcohol so I can get through the rest of this day. Things like that. So it's habit stacking. It's actually shifting. It's it's that's a good use of that term. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all the science that's been done on habits and building habits and habit stacking and all of that stuff, right? You are correct. Yeah. We had um an industry paper done. It was called a consensus paper and it's on our website. You can you can view it at uh, soberlink.com. But it talks about best practices in using our product. And that was really something that they were very much to expand on was that we need to make sure we're changing those behaviors and, and adapting to positive behaviors going forward. I really love this. I mean, I really love that, that you're not just, I mean, that you're really working within the sort of recovery community for the sake of children, really. I mean, like, I think like me, everything, everything you do, everything I do is really for kids. Like at the end of the day, right? And now we're gonna take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. Today's sponsor is Soberlink. Now, the Soberlink system is designed to make parenting time safer with real-time remote alcohol monitoring. Soberlink uniquely combines a breathalyzer with wireless connectivity and is the only system that includes facial recognition, tamper detection, and advanced reporting. Parents can submit a test anytime, anywhere, thanks to Soberlink's wireless technology, which delivers test results by text message or email to the concerned parties. Simplify co-parenting arrangements by using the system that provides transparency and proof of sobriety throughout the day. Flexible schedules combined with real-time delivery of results make Soberlink the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology. And for a limited time, get $50 off your device by emailing info at soberlink.com and mentioning the Divorce Survival Guide. And now back to our show. Are these results then tracked by courts or admissible to court? Like how does, how do you work within the family law system? Yeah. So, you know, one thing that's great about our product is that we're FDA cleared. And we had a third party paper written about our device and all the things that we've done. And it speaks to the Daubert Fry standard and how in all 50 states it meets those standards. So admissibility in court for our device, that really was something that really separates us from kind of everyone else that that does something similar to what we do. And so now you have attorneys that are very confident when they can recommend Soberlink to their clients your reputation that's on the line when you're recommending a a tool for your client. And you need to be pretty confident that these can be used in court. And we have a amazing customer service team. We have a compliance team that will testify in court about the records from a custodial record standpoint. And so I think we have a very robust service that a lot of people just don't realize. Yeah. So are there reports like, is there like a monthly report of like... Yeah, so we're, we're really excited about the way in which we display our, our data because when I first started, I remember it being a report that was, okay, let's see John Doe's um, report. It's 400 trees thick, you know? <laughs> I'm just like, that's a lot of data, you know? But uh, now we've come out with what we call advanced reporting. And what it is, it, it stacks month by month. And we have kind of a color-coded system. Red is non-compliant testing. Yellow is maybe a missed test. And green is compliant. So ideally, you would see a slew of green tests on this monthly report that shows that your client is being compliant. But if you do see a red test, then it goes in to explain what happened during that test. So our protocol states that after you get a positive test, you have to wait 15 minutes to retake a test and confirm that positive, like any type of lab test that you might do. When there's a positive, that lab will always go back and retest the sample to confirm 
that positive, make sure it wasn't a false positive. So we do the same thing with a 15 minute deprivation period time and then ask the client to retest. If they retest positive, then we send out all the the alerts saying that there was a positive test taken. If it comes back compliant, then we know maybe there was something that was introduced to the um, system that was accidental. Our device does test for alcohol. So let's say that you rinsed with Listerine. Listerine has alcohol in it now. You should be removing all products that contain alcohol if you're using something like a, a breathalyzer system like Soberlink. But there are those cases we're in a hurry and, and we live a very busy life. So that does happen. But we wanted to make sure that we confirm every positive test with this retest protocol. So interesting. So we were talking about family law, right? This is something that either attorney will say, hey, this is part of our agreement. This has to, this has to happen. Or someone may say, but do, do judges mandate? We see it happening in a a few different ways. I would say most of our referrals come from court orders Mm -hmm. where the judge is actually ordering alcohol monitoring to for the party to actually get parenting time. So that's a large percentage of our business. But we also see it being done voluntarily where you're like, I think you were mentioning where it's, hey, I want to give this as kind of a, let's prove that I'm not with any issues happening right now. In collaborative process, we also see that the neutral, the mental health neutral in a collaborative process would actually recommend our our device or even in mediation, it would get recommended. But definitely right now, court orders are still the top of where we see most of our referrals coming from. But really, we want to educate attorneys and make sure that they understand the robustness of our system and, and what it can do, no matter what side of the case you're on. If you're on the side of the concerned party, or you're on the side of the um, one who needs the testing, it can be beneficial for both. And that's really what we try to preach. And so what about, what about someone who's being falsely accused, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that someone who's being falsely accused would be like, fine, test me, right? It's like, will you give a DNA sample? (laughs) Like, yes, if you're innocent, yeah, I will. But this is, this is sort of somewhat invasive, right? I mean, not completely, but like- If I, I would if, say this is, this is less invasive than what we see when someone goes down to a lab, gives, it, gives an observed urine test or a blood test to do a PEP test. Mm-hmm. So blowing into a breathalyzer that is, can fit into the pocket or your purse, it's the least an invasive thing that's out there right now that can prove that you're not drinking or that you're documenting sobriety. Like in uh, California, the statute states that you must use the least invasive means possible in family law. And Soberlink ends up being one of those least invasive types of of things that you can use. Well, that makes sense. How's COVID affecting all of this? Yeah, so it it is interesting, you know, um, with the courts being closed in in some, Mm -hmm. in most cases, that's probably where it's affecting it the most. We feel like there's a lot of cases that are, are ready to come to us, but the courts just haven't been able to get through their dockets fast enough. Right. But we do see a lot more cases in mediation, a lot more in, in the collaborative practice happening now. So we see the dynamic changing. But I have seen over the last 30 days, a lot more courts opening up to the virtual Zooms and getting through the docket a little bit uh, quicker. Yeah. So that's one thing. Second, there is the rise in alcohol use. You know, I live in North Carolina. Ooh. They said there was a 71% rise in alcohol use. And I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. But I can understand people are anxious. There's a lot more things to worry about than there was prior to March of this year. So I get it. Will divorce rates rise because of this? Because now you've got two individuals that really are, are um, together for much more time than they have been in the past, probably. Yep. That's still a wait to be a wait to see, but I hope we'll all be able to manage through this. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, my my business is, I mean, I hate to say it because a lot of what I do is should I stay or should I go? That's my coaching is, and I and I coach through divorce. Yes. Sadly, my business has never been better. Yeah. And I don't, whether is that COVID? I mean, people don't actually cite COVID as being one of the reasons, but I think people, it's, it's there's a little more immersion. It's changed um, the relationship dynamic. I mean, I just see it in my own household. 
Heck yeah. I'm now spending much more time with my family than I ever had. I've been on the road once a week and I was traveling to state to state. So now I'm seven days a week and I'm homeschooling and things are just very different. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's true. There's just, there's full immersion with your children and your spouse, right? You're like, it's Correct, yes. right there. I will say as, as a sober person, I am like, thank God I stopped drinking long before COVID because I could, I could see this beginning just, yes. I mean, as slippery a slope as alcohol is to begin with this, this slope is like, <laughs> It's like grease down, right? Yeah, I think that's what, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You nailed it. I mean, it's just a little slippier than it ever has been. Yeah. 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 Good, point. Good point. So how did you get involved? Just, let's just, let's talk about you, Chris. How did you get For involved? Sure. Your, <laughs> how did you, how did you come to, to Sober Lake? Yeah. So it was actually one of my friends that started this business and I knew him in a past life uh, where we used to work before and he kind of recruited me to come over and run some of the marketing. And then there was an opportunity to run kind of the business development to grow awareness of our company on the East Coast. So I moved my family from Huntington Beach, California to oh. North Carolina just about two years ago. Well, you're safer probably in North Carolina because Huntington Beach was like epicenter. COVID, cause they, were not, they were not doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know, there was there were some things happening that were a little bit tough, but that's where the Soberlink headquarters is, is Huntington Beach. So yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah, but I love it. That's where I grew up. You know, I was born in, in Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach. So that's what I know. That's what I know best. But I met my wife out here in North Carolina and we always had plans to come back after we got settled with kids. And now it's it's a lot easier to raise five kids in North Carolina than it is in Hello, a, Southern California. Twelve hundred square foot house in Huntington Beach. <laughs> yeah, I'm in LA, so I, I I feel that I feel that in my soul, yeah. <laughs> and my and my bank account. <laughs> right. But, so you also, but you have a your undergrad was in psychology, right? Yes. With an emphasis on child psychology. So you, there's you seem you clearly have an interest. In children, you have five of them. Yes. <laughs> and you also foster, right? Is that, is that? Yes, I would say that uh, children has always been kind of a soft spot with, with me and my wife shares the same values. She actually had a, um, a sweet spot for fostering. So I was eager to say yes. And so we fostered our first child in 2017 and we adopted him in 2018. And then since then, we've taken on two more. So we have a total of three children out of foster care that are with us. One being adopted, actually two being adopted. Sorry. Last Monday, we adopted officially the second one. Yay, congrats. So, yeah. It, it's, oh, that's uh, a journey. That's a journey. It is a journey. And the, yeah. it was amazing because it was supposed to happen in February, but because of COVID, the courts were behind. So it's taken all the way until August to get the finalization done. So and that's great. But our youngest is now, you know, the next one, hopefully, to get adopted. But she's she's six months old. <gasps> oh, yeah, it's a, it's a fun journey. I, I'll tell you, it's um, definitely given my older kids a little bit different outlook on how to look at life and giving back. And Soberlink, it's a much better fit, I think, for our family because we are able to think about kids and their best interest. And my role in, at Soberlink with business development and educating attorneys about this and keeping family units together is it just actually really hits home and it's perfect. Yeah. Love my job. That's so great. I always appreciate, you know, I think it's so important that you're, I don't know. I mean, yeah, for me, it's important that my work aligns with my values and yes. like the world, yeah. right. Like I can't be the kind of person who like goes to a job and is one person and then comes home and is another person entirely. Right. I mean, Everything I do is for kids, right? I, I always say, I don't give a shit how you do your divorce. If you don't have kids, you can be as nasty, contentious, right, like right. Kind of the cleaners. I don't care. But children are the ones who suffer yeah. when you do that, if you have kids. And so at that point, I care. And I almost all the work that I do is really with the lens of how are we protecting kids in this process? And I think Soberlink 
ties into that so perfectly. Because, I mean, we're, we're, we're not only, Soberlink is not only protecting children physically, their, you know, their, their safety, their actual physical and emotional safety from someone who, with an alcohol disorder, but it's also, it's also keeping communication lines and sort of goodwill open between parents, which is everything. It is. It is. It's that delicate balance. And I think that's what wins at the end. I agree. I agree. Is there anything else that you want people to know about Soberlink, alcohol, how it plays a part in relationships and anything like that? Yeah, I just, you know, I really want to make sure that people see, you know, if they do have something like this, that's an issue and they're going through a divorce, unfortunately, that they see this as a means to empower the individual that has the issue to earn trust back and not to use it as something that they weaponize. Yes. Weaponizing the disease of alcoholism is probably the worst thing that can happen, not only for the individual that's being accused of that, but also for the kids and the way it affects the kid's relationship to that parent. And so if there was one message I had to say, to leave with is use this tool as an empowerment tool to keep the parent parenting and to keep the family unit together. That's really important. Yeah. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. I'm glad I could hear it. And yeah. And for your partnership, I sober link is your, my relationship with you guys really means a lot to me. And, and I think it's just an incredible tool. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.